Before Cyrix and AMD had their own designs, there was only one 32-bit x86 compatible processor which paved the way for later attempts. The processor had a short shelf life and was pulled out of production before leaving much of an impression on the general public, leaving it as something of a rarity today. In this video we will investigate the processor, a compatible floating point unit, and how they compare to the Intel counterparts they tried to compete with, as well as going over a brief history of their makers. This is the Chips and Technologies J3800DX. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and as I just said, we're going to have a look at Chips and Technologies attempt at an x86 processor from the early 1990s. Now, Chips and Technologies are kind of interesting. They were certainly not ones to shy away from a difficult task. They were the first to build a compatible EGA chipset outside of IBM, and also the first to build a compatible VGA chipset outside of IBM, which, yeah, that's no mean feat. And seems as though it was quite popular. They also built motherboard chipsets, uh, laptop graphics chipsets that were quite low power. They seem to have been very good at integration and energy efficiency. So, well, they don't seem that bad. And I guess it was only a matter of time before they attempted to make a CPU. Uh, they were, uh, worth noting, a fabulous company. A lot like Cyrix were, although... C&T seem to have been around first. They may be the first such example of such a thing, at least in this field. Anyway, there's not really much else to say other than it's worth noting this certainly wasn't the first x86 clone. Uh, NEC had done that around 1982 with the V20, but as far as I know, this is definitely the first 32-bit clone of x86. It's uh, probably the first 386 clone. So, yeah. Pretty neat for that, if nothing else, but I guess we need to see how well it actually works, have a look at the machine it's in as well, because I know people probably want to see what's in there, and, well, let's, let's get on with that. There's no point in standing around talking to the camera all day, plus the fact I am cooking and I think it's burning in there, so, yeah, I'd do better to pass you off to the voiceover man, hadn't I? Let's take a quick look at the system we're using here, as I'm sure you'll want to know what I've got set up. So this is a replacement for Melanie, which sucks because I really liked that machine, but it wouldn't work with the C&T CPU, and I have something faster to run the Cyrix 486 DLC processors now, another board which wouldn't run the C&T, which is a shame because it would have removed any bottlenecks. For reasons unknown, it seems either the keyboard controller gets locked up and the system won't post, or only the fast 640k of memory is counted, depending on which motherboard it's plugged into, but it does work with the board in here and this ECS PD386. And we'll discuss oddities with the memory more later, because this isn't the last we're going to hear of them. Yes, this is the Unichips case. The original VLB486 motherboard will do much better somewhere else where the VLB slots can actually be used. It's a shame to waste them. Anyway, pretty case aside, there's the Mitsumi CD-ROM drive. We've seen it before. A 5.25 inch floppy drive which might not stay here, and a regular 3.5 one which will. This turbo display is kind of unusual in that it uses a battery to store the numbers, and it's programmed by pressing the reset switch down on the case meaning it's a completely jumperless display. The turbo switch doesn't even connect to it, and it's toggled with a single wire from the turbo LED header on your motherboard. I've never seen another one like this. Around the back you'll see the usual stuff, being Melanie's replacement, features the same weird VGA card based on the Seng ET4000 and that ancient capture card we will look at in another video, as they do need quite a bit of time to be explained properly and I don't really have that here, it doesn't fit into this video. Now you'll notice there's no Ethernet card, there's no room for one. There is a way I could cheat and get one in there, involving ribbon cables and ISA slots stuck on the end of them, but this is a 386, it won't really be in any need of a constant network connection, and any files transferred will be quite small, so I'll just use a parallel lapling cable with interlink instead. It's much more of an authentic experience anyway. 
set this machine to run as the server and you can actually use the client under Windows on say the K5 making it a relatively easy task to get files in and out and in fact we could share them to the network. So this is adequate for anything we should need to do with this system. All the cards sit on the ISA riser in the middle. This is fine because the ISA bus is parallel anywhere, so this shouldn't actually impact performance. All the slots are wired directly together. We can see, again, the strange video hardware going on in here. One thing I will tell you about this is that the capture device uses a completely different method to the WinTV cards I have, which use analog chroma keying. And it also uses a different method to the ATI Wonder, which utilizes the proprietary AMC interface. The capture card here is a video surge, made by AI Tech, and it actually reads the VGA frame buffer digitally through the Visa feature connector, so the monitor would plug into the capture card and not the VGA card now. Both the cards, as well as the interface, are limited to 8-bit colour at a maximum of 1024 x 768 but the captures are 24-bit and are displayed as such on the monitor. Beneath these cards is the Mitsumi CD-ROM interface. The audio isn't connected, as I just used the port on the front for this, and there's no way to interface it with the current sound card. That sound card, been on the other side of the riser, is the rather large Sound Blaster 1.5. These cards are fairly primitive, and it may get changed later, if only for the convenience of connecting the CD-ROM drive's audio cable to it. We could even use a card with the Mitsumi CD-ROM control interface, and leave the other slot spare for an Ethernet card, I guess. Only time will tell on that one, I'm not really that bothered. It's not hindering me right now, but if it does then, well, we'll look into doing something about it, but it never really caused an issue before. Of course, the host adapter lives underneath this. It's not very interesting. However, what is interesting is that chips and technologies seem to have used their own keyboard controller. In fact, looking at the board, C and T design most of the stuff that's on it. It uses the Peak chipset, which superseded the NEAT and SCAT chipsets for earlier platforms. In the front corner is 16 megabytes of RAM. This board, at least, will start without having all 8 slots populated, which is good as it leaves the other 16 megabytes from this set spare for the 4860LC machine I have now. 16 megabytes is actually overkill for this, so I might just upgrade the 4860LC all the way to 32 megabytes and put 8 1 megabyte modules in here later on. It should be enough for a 3860X, and well, you realistically wouldn't have had that much, I don't think, unless you were doing something really demanding. All the tests in this video were done with this 16 megabytes installed though, so we won't really think about that too much for now. The white connector above the slots is for a 32 bit memory expansion. I have no idea how it would work, what it would look like, or what it would do exactly. I've never seen one, and I'm never likely to, assuming it even existed in the first place, so... Unknown on that one. This motherboard supports only 64k of cache. It has an unusual layout, with what seems to be three tag chips, one of which is very small. Still, coupled with the 32-bit memory connector and my shuttle motherboard detecting only 640k when the C&T processor is installed, it seems that C&T had some really weird ideas about how cache and memory should work. You have to wonder if we'll see a trend develop in the benchmarks later on related to these. My hard drive is a 1GB Quantum, it's not very fast, and it's plain old IDE but it's overkill for a 386, so I'll leave it alone as I'm happy enough with it, it's doing its job. So under that hard drive is the CPU and FPU. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present to you the Chips and Technologies Super 386 and the Super Math 387 coprocessor, model numbers J3800DX and J3800DX respectively. Look at that FPU's chip package though. That is just beautiful, and I've, I've never seen anything else quite like it. Honestly, if somebody were to put one of these in a glass case on a shelf, I'd actually sort of understand it. Although, I think it's much better off in the motherboard here, so well, I'm just going to leave it in here for now. And I can't really see myself pulling it out to do that. That wouldn't really serve any purpose. The CPU, on the other hand, is pin compatible with Intel or AMD processors, but as noted, it might not work properly, if at all, in some motherboards. 
There was another model produced, though I'm unsure whether it ever made it past the testing phases and if it was ever put on a shelf, the J38605DX. This model had a 512 byte level 1 cache, but it wasn't pin compatible with the regular 132 pin 386 package, featuring a larger 144 pin footprint. Likely adding control for the cache and better access to the super state that the chip supported, a feature apparently similar to Intel's system management mode on later processors. Boards which can use the J38605DX are something of an unknown quantity, and I do not know if any are in operation today if they ever existed. There are no real records of these things. However, this may have been one. Because looking at the CPU socket, we can see these extra unused pads with traces leading mostly towards memory and cache areas of the motherboard. Oddly, there's another row on the inside of the socket which does not match the available images of the 38605DX chip. Still, I know there are more boards with extra pins on the CPU socket. Oblivion 100 on YouTube owns a contact board which has additional pins, though it uses a SIS chipset and I'm unclear as to whether the socket is quite the same as mine, but perhaps these boards were both meant to take the J38605DX processors at some point in history. If the one I have was, perhaps the chip was cancelled and the extra pins were just left unpopulated as removing them from the board design would cost time and money, plus fitting the unusual socket would be a further needless additional cost if it was never actually going to be used once the board released. The footprint is also too small for a 486 chip to be fitted. We might never know what the extra pins would for and it would be extremely ill advised to go plugging in a J38605DX to random motherboards to find out what happens unless you could guarantee it would work with that board assuming you could even find one. The picture I showed here is from CPU Shack, and it's the only one of these I've ever really seen in the wild. Please do not pass the CPU Shack to sell these chips to you. They were sold back in 2011, and their current location is unknown. Do feel free to check out CPUShack.com, though, as the guy was cool enough to let me use the photographs, and there's some really neat stuff over there, even non-X86 stuff for you weirdos out there who actually like things to run somewhat efficiently. I mean, what is the deal with that? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, of course. Another idea which occurred to me is that it could be an offset socket for the TI486SXL, but that wouldn't exist for quite some time yet, over a year, and I can't find any evidence that it would be the case, if it was even conceived at this time. So similarly, it would be ill-advised to go around randomly plugging TI486SXL chips into weird motherboards just to see what happens, because, well, it, it probably isn't going to end with fun times. Still, what we're looking at here is the first 32-bit competition to Intel, really. NEC already had the V20 back in the 1980s, but now it was time for something far more ambitious. It's believed Texas Instruments fabricated these processors due to C&T being a fabulous company, possibly even been the first example of such a thing. The J38600DX appears to have been announced in late 1991, and shipped some time afterwards, probably into early 1992. Cyrix would not have their own X86 processors ready until June of 1992, having only made floating point units for existing systems. AMD did have x86 processors, but their design was a direct copy of Intel's with no discernible differences. Next Gen were almost three years away from their own ideas bearing fruit, having tried to clone the 386 themselves and allegedly requiring eight chips to do so, completing the project far too late to be useful and far too expensive to be even remotely cost-effective. Unlike AMD, chips and technologies reverse-engineered Intel CPUs and built their own design. In fact, this is one way software can identify as they never caught and implemented a fairly insignificant bug the Intel designs would produce under certain conditions. Whilst NEC had successfully reverse-engineered the 8088 and likely the 8186 by 1982, and such a feat should not be ignored, the J38600DX marked the first time anybody without their own fabrication facilities had 
really attempted any such thing, let alone the fact they actually successfully brought a 386 compatible CPU to market. I suppose we really should test it. Well, first a few notes about the motherboard. You might have noticed it uses a chips and technologies bias. This thing's a bit weird. It will take parameters for hard drives over 1GB in size, but it can't boot from them, or anything else for that matter, if one is installed. It doesn't mind if you use flashcards though, just as long as they never exceed the roughly 1GB limitation. I don't know what that's about, it's very strange. The BIOS looks simple until you hit the page down key a couple of times and see this. Yeah, now that's quite complicated. It isn't actually that bad due to hints off to the right of the screen. And anyway, I, I doubt you could permanently break anything, though this will cause failure cache option is rather suspicious. Why even include that? That's very strange. You can't help but wonder if it's a leftover feature from certain things that we pondered before. No real way of knowing. If you ever do find yourself working in this bias, be aware you can press the left and right arrows on each register to access additional options. You'd better be sure you want to do something in that bias setup screen, because once you've committed there's no going back. No confirmation message will ever appear except the initial entry into the register editing pages. Hitting escape or F10 will immediately exit the setup program without asking you, either abandoning or saving the settings respectively. This can actually be really annoying if you used to hit in escape to leave the hard drive parameter fields early, as it'll just kick you out without saving the settings. A stupid choice on the part of the programmers. Otherwise, it's not too bad of a bias, and, well, it certainly adds a bit of variety, if nothing else, which is always good when you've worked on this stuff for so many years. There's little point in telling you that a machine I built runs DOS, is there? And we'll save the novel things it can do, and uh, that, and Windows, for another time. But suffice to say, everything feels okay under regular or irregular use. Games work fine, we can even play Dark Forces, and Windows stuff seems quite fluid overall. All in all then, it's a good 3860X machine, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. Processor seems to work, the compatibility element is certainly there, I've had no problems with this at all. It's very stable. It's worth noting it runs much colder than the equivalent Intel part, I believe it's more efficient, it uses 1 or 2 watts less I think. Not that they were particularly power hungry processors back then anyway, but yeah, seems quite efficient. So let's find out just how quick it is versus the Intel chips that it attempted to compete with. I'll be testing under four different scenarios with both CPU and FPU options from Intel and C&T. There's a rumour in places that I've read saying the C&T has slow communication with the FPU, but I'm not really too sure I see that. I can't really say for certain right now. However, an SSI would suggest an Intel 386 paired with an Intel 387 is the slowest option for FPU performance by quite a margin. As you can see, the C&T FPU boosts this, but both FPUs come in faster with the C&T processor installed. There's a small boost churn when using both chips from C&T, though the use of their CPU seems to average around an 8% increase over both tests versus an Intel processor with the same FPU installed. NSSI's CPU benchmark doesn't entirely reflect this, however, as it shows that the Intel CPU paired with a C&T FPU is actually slightly slower than any other configuration. The C&T processor still manages to pull ahead in either configuration, breaking the 10,000 points barrier, around a 550 point increase over Intel CPU. It seems to be just north of a 6% speed boost for the C&T processor, which isn't huge, but it's in line with what we saw when testing the FPU. On raw power then, C&T don't seem to have much of an edge, especially considering the original 386 was from over 6 years earlier, so C&T seem to have managed to gain 1% of a performance increase for every year the 386 was out. Still, perhaps it has a few other tricks. The NSSI tests aren't really a realistic benchmark for real-world use, because they only test a specific aspect of the system. A real application would put strain on memory, cache, and the ISA bus. So, maybe we should try something else. 
3D Bench gives us favourable results for the CNT implementation again. Oddly, the Intel plus Intel configuration loses a fractional amount, which is strange because this test doesn't use the FPU at all, as can be seen with the CNT tests both being identical regardless of which FPU they were paired with at the time. It's within the margins for error, I guess. Still, this test shows a 14.4% boost for chips and technologies versus the quickest Intel result that we saw here, so CNT are in the lead on this one. PC Player goes the opposite way and shows the CNT processor is slower when an Intel FPU is used, where the Intel CPU scores identically regardless of which FPU it is paired with. This is very confusing. The CNT processor wins both tests though, 3.3 versus 4.3, which may not seem like much of an increase, but that's a whopping 30% boost with these small numbers. A figure we might see replicated later on if we pay close attention. I personally suspect the texture mapping may be playing a part. It might have something to do with this figure, though as usual there's no real way to confirm this. Top bench shows interesting results. All of the configurations yield a score of 77 points regardless of CPU or FPU, except when the Intel CPU is paired with an Intel FPU. We see it drop to 72 points. All of these tests are slower than the Shuttle HOT307H motherboard I had before, though that came later and the Opti390 chipsets may be faster than the older C&T Peak chipsets. It's worth noting that the Opti 390s were used on some older 486 motherboards, which would suggest it probably does have an edge over this one. This CNT Peak chipset based board is still scoring very well for a 3860X33 in any case, so there's no clear winners in top bench, but there is a clear loser, and that's the Intel plus Intel configuration. I don't really know what's going on there. Also, Kenai might notice something about the individual microsecond readouts. Speedsys is where things get quite interesting. The CPU test seems dependent on the FPU somewhat. The CNT wins overall again. 4.86 for Intel plus Intel, 5.56 for Intel plus CNT. 5.42 for CNT plus Intel, suggesting that the Intel FPU is dragging things down again, and 5.95 for CNT and CNT. That sounds quite confusing. It's a bit of a mouthful. I hope you understand where this is going. That's why I'm using charts to try and make it a bit easier to follow. This CPU test shows between a 6 and 11% increase for the CNT processors versus Intel when paired with the same FPUs. Level 2 cache will display as level 1 in Speedsys, which is arguably correct, because the CPU has no internal cache, meaning the external cache on the motherboard is the only cache memory available. This test shows a definite preference for Intel CPU, with 25 megs per second versus 23, which leaves the CNT coming in just over 5% slower regardless of installed FPU. One has to wonder what this might have looked like with a J38605DX, but again, we may never know. You also have to question the unusual cache layout of that board. The, that's not specific to this board and CPU. I have a 486 AMI Baby Voyager, which works in a very similar way. Memory bandwidth, however, is a very interesting result, showing the Intel CPU hanging around 79 megs per second, where the CNT sits around 107. This seems very fast for a 386. In case you're wondering, this is around 35% faster in favour of CNT's processor, similar to the PC player results, and leaving me to wonder if this might be why it pulls ahead there. The texture map polygons in PC Player versus the flat shaded ones in 3D Bench Superscape would surely require more bandwidth from the system and especially the memory at some point, if only whilst initially loading that 3D environment. So it might be giving enough of a boost to affect the overall score in that program. I'm not actually sure what they did to it, 
but it might also be a culprit as to why it doesn't work in some motherboards or why my shuttle will only count the fast 640k of memory with the CNT installed. It also seems an odd coincidence that when we've got 6 and 8% recurring a few times that somewhere around 30-35% would recur in more than one test. It's an odd correlation, it might just explain a few things. Memory throughput is far less impressive, but it still swings in favour of CNT with 90 megs per second for Intel versus 20 megs per second for CNT. It's between 7 and 8% faster, which seems consistent with most of the tests we've run here. Doom is going to be quite slow. That's fine though, because you don't have to wait for it like I do. Now we can dispel the idea that it benefits from an FPU once and for all, because the Intel result, while slower with an Intel FPU installed, is consistently so with other tests which we know do not use an FPU either, and we did see that the CPU itself was probably been slowed down somehow in this configuration. Both C and T CPU results appear identical in the Doom test, proving the FPU isn't really used at all. The only instance of a flirt in Doom source code is commented out and it instead uses pre-calculated lookup tables. Also, if you're wondering why I don't shrink the screen as I've been asked that a few times, it's so you can compare it to everything else with a far baseline. For example, if I shrink the screen here, it means testing the K5 again with the screen shrunk to the same size, just to make it a fair comparison. The goal of this test is not to run the game smoothly, it's to run it in exactly the same way on every machine and see how it behaves versus every other machine under the same conditions. As such, we have a valid metric and the scores can be compared, otherwise we'd just be tilting the test in favour of whichever machine we were testing and, well that's not really very accurate, that's not what we're trying to do here, we're trying to have a level playing field. As it is though, we're not comparing it to the K5 today, feel free to do that in your own time. And anyway, Doom's engine isn't really very efficient to be honest, so it has never run that well on here anyway. Regardless of this, the CNT processor shows a 14% boost over Intel with 5.53 frames per second versus 6.32 respectively. Still slow, just play Dark Forces instead, it's a lot better. Quake won't run here, it just throws errors about missing boards or something, I've no idea. Maybe the CPU doesn't support some instruction the game tries to execute, I mean it does really want a Pentium Quake doesn't it? I mean sure you can run it on an X5 but it was built for Pentiums let's be honest. In fact you could argue it was unfairly optimised for Pentium processors. Either way, we can't test it here so that's where this whole thing really ends I guess. Though there is one last test, internal FPU emulation in NSSI, just for those who are curious about it like I am, I mean, we might as well test it, it's there isn't it? The CNT can emulate floating point operations faster than Intel's design, but only by around about 2% with 641 versus Intel 627, so you probably wouldn't really notice it if you were stuck with this. It's much slower than having a real FPU anyway, of course. It's over 250% slower in fact. Yeah, that sucks. Luckily 386 machines rarely had to do this, especially for home users, as most applications were still integer only. And if you really need it, and you can afford it, well then you'd just buy an FPU anyway, right? Removing the FPU does not seem to affect the CPU scores in NSSI. It also doesn't appear to affect Doom or 3D Bench, which is weird because looking at the overall tests, the Intel CPU paired with an Intel FPU definitely turned in worse scores on average versus every other configuration. I have to wonder where the rumour of the CNT having slow FPU communication came from, because it almost looks as if Intel's CPU is dragged down when paired with their own FPU. The, it's also interesting how Intel CPU actually loses 8 points out of thousands granted in NSSI when coupled with a CNT FPU. It seems like there's some strange imprecise science going on here that doesn't quite add up and it's inconsistent with the other tests in some ways, especially the NSSI CPU score dropping. 
but otherwise the consistent drops in the Intel plus Intel performance is really fishy. For the time being, I'm going to really just chalk it up to margins for error, but I don't know. There's something strange going on there, and I can't quite pinpoint what it is. There's no real explanation as to why it should do that, but there's obviously something happening to cause it. Still, CNT's entry to the CPU market might not be that impressive on the surface. It does outpace the Intel design, though not by very much most of the time, but it isn't to be scoffed at. It does work, it does have good compatibility, and it does improve performance, if only a little. So I'd say it was a winner aside from a few minor shortcomings, and there's no denying it was an impressive effort. Besides, it does have a few historically significant consequences, but I'll let the annoying camera guy elaborate on those for me today. So, evidently Chips and Technologies didn't get very far with this processor, or else they'd be absolutely everywhere, like the Intel and AMD ones are. For now, anyway, I imagine those will dry up eventually, because everything always does. But, yeah, people also say that it wasn't successful, and that it couldn't have been a success. And, well, yeah, the performance boost isn't enough to make an impact, but... I don't know, I think they might have had a chance if they'd stuck around. The problem is, they didn't have long enough for it to be a success. The chip seems to have been sold for less than a year, probably six to nine months tops, and OEMs were not very quick on the uptake. I think Texas Instruments might have released some machines that used them, but I can't confirm that. And you can't really blame OEMs for staying away, because there was a court case going on with Intel. So, yeah, that, that might put them off a bit. I mean, they might have been investing in something that's going to disappear. So you can't blame them. On the other hand, that court case is very significant because it was still going on when Cyrix entered the market with a similar idea. Yeah, that's right. Cyrix actually entered the X86 market whilst C&T were in court with Intel. And I imagine they watched very closely. Now, it would prove to be very significant. However, Cyrix's design, we mustn't ignore, is better. They had L1 cache on the processor with pin compatibility with the 386, mostly. I mean, it would work in most any board to some extent. You would get at least a slight boost if it didn't support it properly. And they had 486 instructions, so whilst it had problems, it was less than the CNT processor had, but... Who knows, if the CNT had stuck around, there might have been better support for it on later boards. Still, the court case. Cyrix would have watched very closely, because Texas Instruments actually stepped in, and as it turns out, they had a cross-licensing agreement to manufacture x86 processors. It was ruled that, well, TI are right, they do have a cross-license agreement, and that very agreement is what allowed Cyrix to stay in the market. Unfortunately, C&T got cold feet and backed out, but hell, did they leave anything behind? Of course they did, because that court case was used as evidence, I am sure, when Intel tried to sue Cyrix, or if they came after NextGen, who, well, they had their chips made by IBM, who had pretty much the same licensing agreement. There's an old saying, I think it's probably quite significant here, that we, we should say it. The star which burns twice as bright will burn half as long. And C&T really did burn twice as bright because of this. Their impact can still be felt, because whilst their stay was very short, it was very significant. It would allow Cyrix to hold the title of most powerful x86 processor in 1995, and it would allow NextGen to come in and demonstrate the RISC-8-6 principle, which all our PCs today are using. AMD would then go on to buy NextGen's technology to make the K6, which is a very successful processor, and the K7, of course, which is a legendary processor. So, yeah, I think some of CNT's legacy might just still be alive. Nonetheless, it, it didn't sell very well because it didn't have long enough. And yeah, I, I still think that if they hadn't left, C&T might have found themselves in a good little niche. 
because the reason people say it wouldn't succeed is that it was too late, but I'm not so sure. A lot of people tell me, and I know it to be true, that people were buying 386DX40s around 1993 just because of the cost of these things. If CMT brought their chip up to 40 megahertz, and there's things to suggest they might have done, but I can't confirm it, they could have found themselves in a very nice little niche here. They might have done alright. We'll never know for certain, but it's a significant part of history, and I'm really glad we've been able to document it in a video here. I think it was a good way to start 2018 overall, to be honest. I, I don't know if I'll be able to top that for quite some time. But anyway, yeah, there it is. One of the rarest x86 processors in the world now, really. I don't know how many of them exist. I've, I've only ever seen three of them. Uh, selling at least, and I found this one by complete accident. Uh, the first one I saw was in a private sale, the second one was like offered to me but it was broken, and this one I found by pure luck and it wasn't cheap unfortunately. Uh, the FPUs I think might be slightly more common but yeah they're still hard to find and they probably will set you back uh, a bit more than an Intel or AMD one. Oh no, man, it's history. It's history and it needs documenting. It needs demonstrating and documenting. That's what it's all about. So, I guess I'm pretty much done here. I don't think I had anything else. I did write some points down. Let me just check before we call it a day. Uh, well, I think we already said the compatibility is good. Yeah, you know, they could have done well. Cyrix, AMD, TI fabricated these things, next gen, oh UMC, UMC did enter the field but unlike CNT and Cyrix probably had no legal grounds to be there, I mean they might have got away with it but yeah they pulled out as well which is a shame because unlike CNT they in some cases nearly doubled the performance over Intel's 486, that thing's absolutely terrifying, my one's just out of shot there absolutely love that thing, it's a phenomenal processor, I'd love to see what they could have done if they'd stuck around. But yeah, I, I think that's basically it. Oh, there is one more thing about CNT I guess, I think we already mentioned it, but they weren't entirely unsuccessful, their motherboard chipsets seem to have been fairly widespread, and their laptop graphics chips, well, we know this processor uses less power than an Intel. It's definitely more efficient than Intel's design, power consumption wise. And Well, they used to make laptop VGA chips and they did very well with them. They were in Apple PowerBooks, I think they were in early Compaq Armadas, and my Toshiba satellite has one in. There's an irony in this, in that Intel would later buy CNT for access to this technology. So, yeah, if you can't beat them, absorb them, I guess. I think I've said all there is to say here. As usual, I don't know what's coming next. I've got a few things planned for this year. I'm on a mission to find a Sega CD game that doesn't suck. There has to be something good on there. And I'm discounting scrolling shooters and stuff, because they don't need to be... They just use it as a CD player. They're not Sega CD games. Screw that. I want something that uses the technology in the Sega CD. I might have found something. It might be this year's Halloween video. I don't know yet. It's quite a ways away. So, otherwise, who knows what this year holds, but I think I've wittered on enough. We've covered this, we know what it is, we know what it does, it's pretty good. So I'm High Treason, thank you ever so much for watching. I hope you continue to do so, I hope this year proves to be as good as the last one, if not better. And always remember, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 622 up. I'm out of here.